Until this moment, nobody in a history ever brought any evidence that JC ever existed. Do you know that? Check the, the Christian writings, not me, their writings. Christianity started between 70 to 300 years after JC died. According to all opinions, it was at least three to four generations until Christianity just started. Therefore, the first book that was written about JC, the writer never knew him. He never saw him. He has no idea how he looks and where he lives or anything about his life. Why? I can tell you anything about the grandfather of my grandfather. I have no idea who he was. I can tell you he walked on water. I can tell you he had wings. And I can tell you he had an eye from a glass. I can say whatever I want. If you're foolish enough, you believe me. If you're smart, you tell me, my friend, bring me hard evidence. But by far, the most impressive of the entire bunch is that Daniel would predict the exact day and date that Jesus Christ would enter the front gate of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9 that the people rejoice as the king cometh on the back of a foul donkey. This would be the 10th of Nisan, or more precisely, April 6th, 32 AD, four days before the crucifixion. Daniel is giving you the exact starting point. Daniel 9.25 states, Know and understand this, from the time that the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the king comes. The date that a Persian king gave the decree of Artaxerxes on March 14th, 445 BC to restore and rebuild Jerusalem after the Persians had defeated Babylon in exactly the way by exactly the guy, Cyrus, that Isaiah had predicted 200 years in advance. Countdown leading to the precise day and writing this more than 500 years in advance. It brings new meaning to when Jesus Christ told the Pharisees, you think that in those scriptures you have eternal life, but it's those very pages that speak of me. Because of the mass reports of healings and blind eyes open on many occasions, the masses had wanted to make him king, but he never allowed them to praise him and declare him out as king until one very particular day that Daniel had given the math for more than 500 years in advance. Arriving at the front gate of Jerusalem, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, told Jesus, you have to shut these people up. This is heresy. Jesus replied to the Pharisees, If I were to silence these people, indeed I tell you, even the rocks of this place would cry out. 69 times 7 times 360, using the identical calendar system of the ancient world, most especially Babylon, making provision for the 24-day difference between March 14th and April 6th, as well as your 116 days added in for leap years, you're going to come up to exactly 173,880 days. On the money, Daniel's margin of error, more than 500 years beforehand from that angel's lips, was precisely Zero. All of its history since the 1830s, dispensationalists were predicting the refounding of the state of Israel. 
Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. God clearly shows that the fig tree is his people, Israel. He said, when the fig tree puts on fresh leaves, that's what happened to Israel in 1948. Israel was not born, it was restored. It put on fresh leaves. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. A comparison of the lives of Moses and Jesus of Nazareth reveals at least 50 elements common to both lives, many of which were beyond the ability of any human to control. Consider the unusual multiple roles that Moses and Jesus both played, prophet, priest, lawgiver, teacher, and a leader of men. Both taught new truths from God, and both confirmed their teaching with miracles. Both spent their early years in Egypt, supernaturally protected from evil kings who sought their lives. Moses' family initially did not accept his role, but later his brother Aaron and sister Miriam helped him. Jesus' brothers and sisters initially failed to follow Jesus, but later his brother James became leader in the church in Jerusalem. Each of them was considered the wisest man of his day. Both confronted demonic powers and successfully subdued them. Moses appointed 70 rulers to rule Israel, Jesus anointed 70 disciples to teach the nations. Moses sent 12 spies to explore Canaan, Jesus sent 12 apostles to reach the world with the gospel. Both fasted for 40 days and faced spiritual crises on mountain tops. Just as Moses stretched out his hand over the Red Sea to command it to part to save the Israelites, so Jesus rebuked the Sea of Galilee and quieted the waves to save his disciples. Both of their faces shone with the glory of heaven Moses on Mount Sinai and Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. While Moses rescued Israel from the dead religion of pagan Egypt, Jesus rescued Israel from the dead letter of the law of tradition. Moses and Christ cured lepers and proved their spiritual authority through the miracles they performed before many witnesses. Moses conquered Israel's great enemy, the Amalekites, with his appraised arms. Jesus conquered our great enemies of sin and death by his appraised arms on the cross. Moses lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness to heal his people. Jesus was lifted up on the cross to heal all believers from their sin. Despite the spiritual leadership of Moses and Jesus, the Jewish people were ungrateful to both men and rebelled against them. Both generations that rebelled against the two men sent from God died due to their lack of faith. One generation died in the wilderness of Sinai and the other died in the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Moses promised that God would send his people another prophet. Jesus promised his church that his father would send another, comforter, the Holy Spirit. On the 14th day of the month of Nisan, which was the feast of the Passover, both Moses and Jesus freed all who would trust them. On the 17th day, the Feast of First Fruits, Moses brought about the resurrection of the children of Israel by taking them through the parted Red Sea. On the Feast of First Fruits, Jesus ensured the resurrection of all believers by becoming the symbolical first fruits of the resurrection as he rose from the dead. Fifty days after the Jews passed through the Red Sea on the Feast of Pentecost, God gave Israel the gift of the Torah, the law of God. Fifty days after Christ's resurrection, on the Feast of Pentecost, God gave his church the great gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The shroud has been studied actually by some of the top scientists and researchers in the world. And with all the scientific knowledge and equipment, we still do not know how the image of the shroud was produced. And this is what I think continues to fascinate us about it. Regardless of what you believe, whether you are a Christian and a believer and believe that this is the image of the resurrected Christ, or if you just believe that there is some other extraordinary metaphysical event that causes this, you have to be fascinated by the fact that this extraordinary relic could not have been created by any means that in the 21st century we can identify. The shroud image is made from tiny fibers that are one-tenth the size of human hair. And the picture elements are actually randomly distributed 
like the dots in your newspaper photograph or magazine photograph. To do this, you would need an incredibly accurate atomic laser. This technology does not exist. Could the Shroud of Turin really be a divine relic? Tangible evidence of the existence of an almighty power. And in 2011, Italian scientists were able to prove that the Shroud of Turin was created by a supernatural flash of light, an unearthly flash of light. In my opinion, the Shroud of Turin is proof that Jesus transformed himself into a being of light and projected himself through the Shroud of Turin. The science of probability has some interesting things to say about the Old Testament prophecies regarding a Messiah. Professor Emeritus of Science, Peter Stoner of Westmont College, with the help of 600 college students, calculated the probability of one man fulfilling just eight of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. The students carefully weighed all the factors and examined the various circumstances which might indicate that men had somehow conspired together to fix these individual prophecies. They made their estimates as conservative as possible. Then Professor Stoner invited other scientists to submit their own independent estimates to gauge if the calculations of his students were accurate. Yet it was what the statistical conclusions indicated that was astounding. By the most conservative estimate, some 456 messianic prophecies were fulfilled in one man, Jesus of Nazareth. But Professor Stoner and his students examined only eight of those prophecies. According to the science of probability, the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies is one in 10 to the 17th power. How big a number is 10 to the 17th power? If you covered the entire state of Texas to a depth of two feet with silver dollars and then dropped in a single mark dollar and mixed them all up, your chance of finding that mark dollar on your first try wearing a blindfold would be one in 10 to the 17th power.